So here is the document <clears throat> and our learning objectives over the remainder of the next half hour or so are gonna to be to discuss the cardiovascular adaptations to exercise so we can all come away with an understanding of what's normal and expected. We'll tackle the differential diagnosis of what we think about when we encounter quote abnormal findings among competitive athletes. And then we'll talk a little bit about clinical implementation of multimodality imaging. I do wanna take this opportunity to recognize the writing group that I had the pleasure of working with. Uh, it was a tremendous group of people and I'll just run through them by name real quickly. So Bob Battle and Chris Kramer from the University of Virginia, uh, Tim Beaver, formerly of Dartmouth, now University of Kansas, uh, William Border from Atlanta, Pam Douglas from Duke, um, Nat Martinez, formerly of Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, now in Morristown, New Jersey, Dermot Phelan, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, Tamana Singh, Cleveland Clinic, Rory Weiner, a colleague of mine at the MGH, and then Eric William, Williamson and Mayo. And last but not least, I wanna recognize our sonographer representative, Jennifer Mercandetti, formerly Jennifer Neary. Jennifer was a sonographer with us here at the MGH for many years and was really regarded as a true expert in her field. Um, what Jennifer and other sonographers mean to the, to the field of sports cardiology cannot go uh, overemphasized. Um, it is the men and women that have joined us in the field going to strange places, whether it be athletic boathouses or training facilities, locker rooms, playing fields, willing to take ultrasound out into the field that have enabled many of the data sets that I'm gonna share with you today. So uh, just a, an opportunity to really appreciate the partnership between the scientists and the sonographers. The beginning of this document really tries again to redefine how the field of sports cardiology looks and what the care paradigm for the athlete has evolved to look like. Again, the athlete and their family remain at the center and they're now surrounded, particularly when they're suspected or confirmed cardiovascular disease, by their trainers, their sports medicine docs, and those of us that practice sports cardiology. From that, as the nature of the problem is delineated, the team of, of cardiovascular experts that surround that inner shell grows and can be tailored. And this invariably includes expertise in pediatric cardiology, genetic heart disease, cardiomyopathic disease, interventional EP specialists, and of course, as we'll be discussing today, cardiovascular imaging specialists. One of the, the common themes you'll see within a multimodality imaging document is the opportunity to compare and contrast the different strengths of the imaging modalities we have at our fingertips. And I'll show you here, um, we had attempted to summarize this in this table with uh, some of the attributes that make ECHO look favorable, including low cost, its accessibility, its portability, the bulk of normative data that we have using, using ECHO. Uh, speaking of accessibility, this here is a picture of Jennifer uh, Mercandetti taking ECHO images of a Tara Hamara runner in the Copper Canes in Mexico. So again, an, an example of how the portability has really helped us push the field. In contrast, the, the tomographic imaging modalities, so CT and MRI are, are, are vastly superior with respect to characterizing LV and RV morphology and really looking at tissue composition. They're also the, the, the gold standard of, of choice tests when, with respect to defining extracardiac structures like coronary anatomy, as well as the aorta and great vessels. So let's talk a little bit about exercise-induced cardiac remodeling, <clears throat> which is the phenomenon by which the heart and blood vessels respond to repetitive bouts of, of, of exercise stress. So to begin this discussion, I like to return to the paradigm of valvular heart disease to just remind the audience that the ventricle is an incredibly plastic structure. As this audience knows well, the aortic valve can get sick in one of two ways. It can either leak or it can tighten, and we know those as aortic regurgitation or aortic stenosis. Aortic regurgitation represents a primary volume challenge for the ventricle and over time <clears throat> produces a remodeling phenomenon dominated by chamber dilation with minimal wall thickening, which we know as eccentric hypertrophy. In contrast, the pressure challenge of aortic stenosis leads to a very different LV geometry with wall thickening at the expense of the chamber volumes, which we characterize as concentric hypertrophy. How does this apply to sport and exercise? Well, it does so quite nicely. Uh, endurance activities, including Nordic skiing, rowing, running, swimming, triathlon, these are marked physiologically by sustained and often marked increase in cardiac output. So four to five fold increases in cardiac output over resting values. This is largely accomplished by increases in heart rate and some stroke volume augmentation, uh, coupled with a very profound vasodilation in the peripheral blood vessels. For the heart, for all four chambers of the heart, this represents a volume challenge. And again, the expected changes that we see in these sports are largely mediated by volume. In contrast, <clears throat> strength activities, including burst 
exercises like football, where the activities are short, sweet, but very intense, or weightlifting, or hammer throwing, or discus throwing. This is a, a very different physiology. Here we see repetitive surges in systolic blood pressure, often in excess of three or 400 millimeters of mercury, uh, which are generally caused by skeletal muscle contraction and some element of vasoconstriction. For the heart, um, particularly for the left ventricle, this is not a volume challenge, but rather a pressure challenge. So this leads us to the concept of sports-specific cardiac remodeling, in which we think about sports as existing on, as some combination of either a dynamic or a static component. Those terms are borrowed from the skeletal muscle literature, and I think as cardiologists and cardiovascular practitioners, we're better off thinking about these as, as increasing volume and increasing pressure. And so what you can do is you can look for your favorite sport on this cube and determine what the principal mixture of pressure and volume uh, physiology is. And in doing so, you can use that to anticipate different forms of ventricular remodeling. So as we move up the increasing dynamic component, moving from left to right on the x-axis of the graph, we expect to see dilation of both the right and the left ventricles. And sports that are a relatively pure volume challenge, such as long distance running, do a fair bit of dilation without much in the way of wall thickening. In contrast, as you move up the y-axis where you're increasing the static or pressure component, you get isolated wall thickening, oftentimes at the expense of chamber dimensions. And when you put the two together in the form of a sport that's both high volume and high, high pressure, rowing would be a good example of that, you get them both. You get dilation of the ventricles, but a modest amount of wall thickening indeed. So the take home from this is that when we're asking what's normal, we need to know what type of athlete we're dealing with. There are a number of large data sets that define normal values in healthy athletes, and these are two examples here that emerge from the Italian experience. The first looks at left ventricular wall thickness, and the second looks at left ventricular chamber size. And the first important observation here is that when you look at large groups of athletes and amass cardiac data, you find that like any population, they follow a normal distribution. What's most challenging about this population, however, is the fact that a significant minority of them, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent, depending on where you make your cut points, exist in a, in, in a place where we as typical clinical imagers would define them as being pathologically or abnormally enlarged. And so this is really the basis of, of the gray zone diagnostic area, which we'll talk about in more detail shortly. Uh, the same is true for the right ventricle, perhaps even more so. These again are data coming from Italy in which the hearts of both strength and endurance athletes have been measured with transthoracic echo. And what you can see here is that a significant percentage of these athletes, most commonly the endurance athletes, have right ventricular dimensions which far exceed that which we would consider to be normal. Uh, another example here, even making this point more concretely, these are data from, from the United Kingdom in which the investigators again used transthoracic echo to measure right heart size and endurance athletes and found that depending on which dimension you look at, anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of these athletes will exceed the upper limits of normal, thereby raising the question of whether they're healthy or they harbor some form of heart disease. So one of the things we tried to do in this paper was amass what we thought were the most critical normative data sets um, for several reasons. One is to really show the reader that a lot of work has been done in this field and we now have good normative data, but more importantly to make the point that when we're considering what normative data we should use, it's of absolute critical importance to take into account the athlete type, what sport they play, what gender they are, and what country they come from, or what race they are, pre uh, preferentially. And so what I mean by that is that if you look at these reference values, you can compare normal reference values for female collegiate athletes that play team sports, where your average values are 47 plus 7 millimeters for left ventricular uh, and diastolic diameter, versus a group of elite Dutch cyclists where the dimensions are uh, don't even overlap at all, and you're getting values in the 60 plus minus 4 range. Same is true of left ventricular wall thickness. Again, a number of good studies have looked at what we can expect to see for walls. And again, there's a fair bit of variability based on athlete type. Here, just by way of example, uh, female Italian multi-sport athletes, eight plus minus one millimeters compared to US Olympic rowers who tend to be much thicker and with, with very little overlap at 13 plus minus two. So here's a figure from the paper, uh, a representative transthoracic uh, imaging series from a highly competitive uh, endurance athlete. And there are several important things to point out. Here again, we see evidence of both chamber enlargement as well as wall thickening. So again, this would be eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy as measured here in a parasternal long axis view. 
Commonly, when you look at the apical four-chamber view, you'll see predominance of the right heart with an equal one-to-one -one distribution of the left and right heart, again, emphasizing the fact that endurance sport is a stimulus for biventricular remodeling. And then one of the most important hallmarks of a healthy endurance athlete is supranormal diastolic function. So transmitral EA ratios in excess of two and tissue velocity imaging with pulse wave uh, velocities in excess of 20 centimeters per second. I wanna take a second just to identify one area that's often confusing for people and that's diastology, particularly diastology looking at pulmonary vein flow. So in the clinical echo lab, we look at the ratio of the S wave to the D wave and indeed D predominance, particularly in patients with pathology, is often considered to represent a marker of left atrial hypertension, elevation and wedge pressure. This is not the case in endurance athletes and we see this D predominance, but it's a very different physiology. Here, we're not seeing blunting of the S wave, we're seeing accentuation of the D wave. And this is caused again by very rapid, uh, brisk relaxation of the ventricle during early diastole, which quite literally sucks blood out of the left atrium and pulmonary veins into the ventricle and thereby causes this pattern, which in other situations may be associated with pathology. In contrast, this is a representative series of pictures from a strength trained athlete where you see a very, very different looking heart. Here you're seeing thick walls, but a relatively normal left ventricular um, and diastolic dimension. And again, when you're looking at the apical four chamber view, you'll see that the left heart is predominant with very little evidence of right heart dilation. And this emphasizes the fact that isometric or pressure-based training has very little effect on any chamber other than the left ventricle, particularly in, in the presence of a competent mitral valve. The thickening that occurs from strength training carries a very different diastolic pattern, and it speaks to the fact that this form of hypertrophy, which is again of a, a, a concentric geometry, um, tends to look more like a stiff heart sort of pattern, where you end up with um, a, a dominant A wave and oftentimes an, an EA ratio of less than one. And this is also manifest in uh, accentuated filling or, or tissue activity uh, using tissue Doppler imaging. So having looked a little bit at what's normal, let's talk about how we use when we understand what normal is to differentiate health from disease. And this is where the concept of the athlete's heart comes in. In the imaging suite, whether you're working with echo or CT or MR, there are basically four findings that occur that raise question of health versus disease. And these are thick walls, dilated chambers, dilated right ventricles, or hypertrabeculation of apical and midventricular tissue. And this is a, a busy, but I think instructive diagram that comes straight from the paper. Uh, I'm not gonna run through every single box in this paper, but let's use thick walls to explain how one can use this figure in clinical practice. So when an athlete is imaged and there is a measurement made of thick walls, uh, after confirming the measurement is made correctly, which I'll speak about uh, in more detail in a moment, um, the first thing to do is to run through the list of clinical factors, things we might know about this athlete, which would lead us to, to conclude appropriately that this was physiologic rather than pathologic. So again, knowing sport type and confirming that there's isometric physiology, um, oftentimes this is more common in, in men and in men of, of black ethnicity, confirming that these are normal tensive athletes that aren't uh, set up for hypertensive heart disease, that they're asymptomatic, that they have no family history, and that they have a normal 12 lead ECG. All of those features in isolation would decrease your pretest probability of finding pathology. That being said, you found thick walls, so it's important to consider the differential diagnosis, which as the audience will be uh, well familiar with, includes things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertensive heart disease, illicit drug use, particularly uh, androgenic anabolic steroids, infiltrative heart disease, and diseases of the heart valves. When the remainder of the imaging data is looked at in, in tandem with the thick walls, there are some clues that this is truly physiology and not disease. So the, the fact that the thickening is relatively mild, so less than 15 or 16 millimeters in all cases, the fact that there's very little in the way of atrial pathology, that the RV looks normal again, because this is caused by strength sports largely, and that the valves are normal, those really tip you toward this being physiology rather than pathology. So it, within the document, um, key points to remember with respect to uh, managing the finding of thick walls, that in Caucasian athletes in the 11 to 13 millimeter range, this is typically consistent with physiology, not disease. And we can extend that up to 15 millimeters in black athletes who, who are, in general tend to have thicker walls. Um, the measurement of wall thickness, which is oftentimes really not done well, um, needs to be done very carefully. And I'll give you some examples of where we find pitfalls most commonly. Um, 
in athletes, particularly in endurance trained athletes, anytime we're seeing thick walls with concomitant reduction in indices of diastolic function, that should really raise um, question for pathology. And then echo is not perfect. So if after a good echo exam, we're not sure what we're looking at, particularly if there's image dropout from rube shadows or we're not able to get a full circumferential view in the short axis images, this is where the use of, of cardiac MR becomes a, a great next option. With respect to measurement pitfalls, there are two that are most commonly made. And again, in clinical practice, the most common reason an athlete gets thick walls is not because of what they have, but because of how it's measured. And these are examples of how it goes wrong. So as per ASE recommendations, uh, measurement of the interventricular septum should include contractile tissue only and not trabecular tissue that ex exists on the RV free surface of the septum. And you can see here both in a parasternal long and a parasternal short axis view, how the same heart can be ver me measured very differently. Now, th this can be challenging to do in clinical practice and requires moving from still frames to videos. And indeed, in the supplemental videos that are included as part of the online version of this document, you can see how visualizing the septum and, and identifying what contracts and what doesn't can really help you be sure that you're only measuring that sweet spot that should be, be used to differentiate what's normal from abnormal. There's trouble on the back of the heart wall as well. Um, as most of you are aware, we try to get our, our measurements of heart wall thickness up as close to the mitral valve plane as possible, but in doing so often run the risk of including um, posterolateral cordal tissue in those measurements. And you can see here that measurement at four different places within this ventricle, particularly without careful attention to the presence of cordal tissue can make measurements range from 10 millimeters, which would be completely normal to 16 millimeters, which would, be, which would have a very high likelihood of reflecting disease. So again, just a plug to be very careful in your measurements, both in the septum and in the posterior lateral wall to make certain that what you're measuring is truly accurate contractile tissue. With respect to the LV chamber, um, a slightly different beast. Um, again, initially the characterization is and should be done by TTE. Um, I will say that although cut points for left ventricular wall thickness are useful, cut points for the left ventricle and the left atrium are really not very useful. And that's because exercise-induced cardiac remodeling can really cause the, the heart to dilate quite dramatically such that it overlaps with all forms of heart disease. We've seen left ventricular and diastolic diameters in the 65 to 70 range, not uncommonly among elite competitive athletes. And so the, the, the sizes in isolation are, are of very little value. The other thing that's worth pointing out, uh, particularly among endurance athletes, is that it's not abnormal to see mild reductions in left ventricular ejection fraction with things ranging from 45 to 55 percent. And this is due to the fact that the LV ejection fraction is not physiologically regulated, rather stroke volume is. So if one starts with a large end diastolic volume and has a normal stroke volume at rest, they need eject a, a, a smaller percentage of that. So again, um, I would caution the listeners not to ascribe an ejection fraction of 48% to pathology in the right type of athlete. The right heart uh, shown here um, is characteristically very different when it's healthy than when it's unhealthy. And these are images comparing physiologic dilation to the dilation of, of arrhythmic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy. The dilation associated with physiology is, is almost always associated with both dilation on both the left and right side of the heart but also a smooth, thin-walled structure with normal contractile function, no evidence of sacculation, aneurysm, um, or other structural problems. The key points when thinking about imaging the, the RV is that RV dilation, when it's physiologic, is always in conjunction with LV dilation. There's no sport physiology that I'm aware of that causes the RV to dilate without some dilation of the LV. And then here, more than ever, we're starting to appreciate the importance of multimodality imaging, uh, as the audience is well aware. Transthoracic echo, which is really our workhorse and useful in many situations, is quite limited with respect to what it can do for the RV. So if in doubt, in an athlete that has a reasonable pretest probability for RV pathology, um, the echo is often insufficient here, turning to the cardiac MR is of, of tremendous value. The final differential diagnostic conundrum is that of hypertrabeculation, uh, the common finding in uh, left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy. It turns out that hypertrabeculation is also a well-recognized uh, response to athletic training. This tends to be more common in black athletes and black athletes that participate in endurance sports. Um, and the key here is that the non-compacted physiologic heart has normal wall thicknesses below the non-compacted segment and always has normal left ventricular diastolic and systolic function. Um, here, and this is just a reminder, it's often very useful to use IV ultrasound enhancing agent 
to really confirm where the boundary of compaction and non-compaction lies. And in anyone that has non-compaction with suspected pathology, um, most often a reduction in ejection fraction, CMR imaging can be quite useful in resolving the, the, the diagnostic dilemma. There are two entities in which multimodality imaging moving from the echo into the CT MR world are absolutely essential. The first is suspected aortopathy. The aorta is not a particularly responsive organ to training, so it's very unusual to find young competitive athletes with any element of aortic dilation with um, limits set at 40 for men and 37 for women. And indeed, when we're imaging and we're seeing dilation at either the level of the sinuses or the ascending aorta, it becomes imperative to follow that up with some form of tomographic imaging, either CT <clears throat> or MR based on your institutional preferences. And here the goal is really to characterize the extent of the aortic arch and tree, including the descending thoracic aorta to really document both the magnitude of dilation and also the areas of involvement. The other um, entity which requires the use of multimodality imaging is that of anomalous coronary circulations uh, in good hands with careful imaging, um, including the use of color scale at very low velocities. Both the proximal left and right coronary origin can be identified in anywhere from 95 to 97% of patients by TTE. However, um, once this diagnosis is made or in situations where the coronaries can't be identified definitively, either CT or MR is absolutely essential to define uh, the anatomy in a way of determining the risk associated with this diagnosis. So looking for the high risk features, which include um, the angle of takeoff from the aorta, a slit like ostium, the presence of the artery coursing through the walls of the aorta, a so-called intramural course, the artery's relationship to both the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and then the caliber of the distal vessel are all things that require either CT or MR to do effectively. So I want to say a word about pre-participation screening and how this was handled in the document, because this is an incredibly important and controversial issue in the world of cardiology. Um, I could use a number of different cases to explain the importance of, of why we screen, but one I, I turn to quite commonly is a, a gentleman I knew well by the name of Ryan Shea, <clears throat> who was one of our elite level competitors uh, at the marathon distance. Uh, and in 2007, he participated in the Olympic marathon trials in uh, Central Park in New York City and at mile five pulled over to the side of the road and collapsed and had a cardiac arrest. He was subsequently found to have a genetic heart problem that almost certainly could have been prevented if the screening had been, been done effectively. There are a long list of diseases that put young athletes at risk for sudden death during sport, and I won't name each of them here, but I will remind you that the, the, the way I think about these clinically and the way I teach our fellows to think about these is to, um, is to divide them anatomically into disorders that affect the cardiac muscle, the cardiac electrical system, the coronary circulation, the heart valves, and things outside of the heart, namely the aorta. And indeed, when we're talking about screening, when we're talking about preventing adverse effects during sport, this is the list of things that we're looking for. Screening again is controversial, but the one universal, uh, universally agreed upon fact is that regardless of whether you practice in the US or Europe or South America, any organization that, that's looked at this question has put forth an imperative to do some form of screening. And that basic form of screening, uh, it relies on a history and physical. <clears throat> In the United States, the medical legal standard, the minimum that we're held to is the 14 point question in history, uh, which looks at elements of personal history, family history, and four succinct physical examination maneuvers, listening for pathologic heart murmurs, palpating femoral pulses to exclude coarctation, looking for the physical stigmata of Marfan syndrome, and auscultating brachial artery blood pressure. If any of us were ever asked in a court of law whether we appropriately provided screening services. These are the things that we should be documenting. But I think there's a recognition uh, among those of us that think about this critically that the history and physical is probably not a particularly sen sensitive nor specific tool. And so this is where things get controversial, and that is with the addition of other tests. Um, at present, the biggest debate is with the use of the 12 lead ECG. The American guidelines, which were recently updated, um, do not call for mandatory ECG use, where in, uh, in, in in comparison, the Europeans have said that any athlete between the ages of 12 and 35 should be screened with a 12 lead ECG before sport participation. I will point out that the uh, American guidelines do make the caveat that the ECG is considered an appropriate best standard of care in places that have the resources to do it well. And part of doing it well is having the imaging core facility to follow up abnormalities on the ECG. So in our document, um, we chose to very much um, endorse and support the current American guidelines, and that is to, to advocate for a focused personal medical history and physical exam. 
and to um, encourage the use of ECG only in situations with adequate financial resources and clinical expertise. Uh, we collectively as a group recommended against the use of any form of imaging, whether it be echo, CT, or MR during first line pre-participation screening, but made a very strong statement that anyone that engages in screening, particularly people that run screening programs, should only do so if they're in a place that they are able to provide timely access to the clinical centers, both with, with sports cardiology expertise and also with the full cadre of clinical imaging required to work up the abnormalities found during screening effectively. This is the diagram that was generated to think about the flow of screening and, and particularly the role of imaging in, in the downstream testing of screening findings. So whether it's medical history findings, things like exertional symptoms, prior syncope, physical exam findings, or any number of, of high pretest probability ECG patterns, that those should be followed up immediately by first line transthoracic echo. And then based on the results of echo, athletes can be put into one of three pathways. They can have their pathology definitively excluded by echo, in which is oftentimes the need to do no additional testing. There can be an inconclusive echo exam in which on a case by case basis, the addition of additional imaging techniques and or exercise testing is valuable. And then when pathology is identified definitively here, um, the additional tools we have in our toolkit are important for confirmation and risk stratification. That really needs to be done on a patient by patient and a diagnosis by diagnosis um, level. So finally, I wanna say a little bit about the symptomatic athlete and how we approach this in the document. There was a lot of discussion about what level of detail to get into uh, around symptomatic athletes. Is that really the purview of imagers? And as the chair of the document, I felt strongly that um, imagers are not separate from the clinical care of people. We not only look at images and interpret images, but we need to know who those people are. I learned this very early on in my training at the Mass General. Probably the person that taught this the best was Mike Picard, who many of you know, current editor-in-chief of Jace, who always reminded us that it was worth taking the time to stop and call a referring provider to ask a little bit about the patient if that was of relevance. And there's probably no patient population where this has proved to be more useful than in the, the evaluation of the symptomatic athlete. So there are five key symptoms I wanna talk about and again, give you some ideas on how to think about these things, but also how and when to include imaging. So the first is chest pain. Chest pain is probably the most common thing we encounter as cardiologists and young healthy athletes. And the good news is that 95% of it has nothing to do with the heart. This is a reminder that um, the musculoskeletal examination for cardiovascular specialists is incredibly, incredibly important. And a comprehensive MSK exam in the athlete with chest pain will reveal a soft tissue or bony etiology more often than not. In fact, Patients referred for echo often get their MSK diagnosis when the sonographer pushes hard on a rib space and finds an area that's been strained, and lo and behold, the rest of the echo is not even necessary. That being said, the more typical in nature the chest pain is, so the more it's reproduced by exertion, relieved by rest, um, the more likely it is to reflect one of those concerning um, cardiac pathologies that I listed for you several slides ago. And so indeed, imaging is at, in some cases appropriate in the athlete with chest pain. And in the document, the 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 guidelines put forward were that TTE should be performed as the initial choice among people with either possible or probable cardiac chest pain. Another way of saying that is if you found musculoskeletal or, or non-cardiac chest pain during your clinical examination, an echo is not necessary. Um, in these situations, imaging is not sufficient in, in its own right. That imaging either needs to be tied to an exercise test or an exercise test needs to be done in isolation. And one of, the, one of the important things to remind the, the imaging stress world is that the physiology of the healthy athlete is such that they experience incredibly rapid heart rate recovery. And just the simple 30 second move from the treadmill to the supine position for, for echo imaging can cause reductions in heart rate of 40 to 50 beats per minute. So oftentimes very, very difficult on a typical treadmill stress echo to get images that are truly done at a diagnostic heart rate. And that raises the question of, of how we should be doing these, which I have a number of thoughts if people are interested. Um, when TTEs are done in people with Prob possible or, pr or probable cardiac chest pain. Um, it is absolutely essential in this young patient population that the, the coronary anatomy be defined. Uh, in, in our practice, we have a saying, and that is that any athlete that has symptoms that, that exist anywhere between the nose and the belly button have to have their coronaries delineated until, until proven otherwise. And in situations where the TE doesn't do that effectively, CT or MR needs to be the, the next step. Syncope, probably the second most common thing we deal with, and very much like chest pain, um, syncope is almost always 
benign in athletes. Again, 95 to 97 percent of the syncopal episodes that occur in athletes are accentuation of normal physiology and neurally mediated mechanism that occur independent of exercise. So high vagal tone um, coupled with increased barosensitivity in the context of exposure to pain, anxiety, fright. Th those syncopes are of no concern to us as cardiologists. Similarly, the athlete that collapses after they stop exercising due to a sudden reduction in blood pressure are of no concern to the, uh, to the cardiologist. The athletes we care about, the true needles in the haystack, are the ones that syncopize during exercise. And these are the, the very small minority of people that end up in tertiary referral centers and really re require the, the full breadth of our, of our evaluation capacity. So with respect to recommendations for the syncopal, episode, uh, syncopal athlete, um, if the history is strongly conclusive that it's neurally mediated, there's really no need to proceed any further. If you get a history of clear vasovagal physiology, either after exercise or independent of exercise, imaging is not gonna be useful. It is the athletes that have syncope of unclear etiology, particularly those that syncopize during exercise. These are the athletes that are running and collapse suddenly, they're walking down the court, they collapse suddenly. These are the ones in which starting with a TT, but having a very, very low um, threshold to move to multimodality imaging is really very important because definitive exclusion of, of myocardial valvular electrical and coronary pathology is absolutely the key to keeping them healthy. Um, these people should also, particularly if they exercise during exercise, if they syncopize during exercise, have some form of maximal effort limited exercise test. And again, I want to really emphasize the words maximal effort limited. Exercise stress labs that apply an 85% peak heart rate limit to their test because this is the standard for excluding coronary disease in older athletes um, are going to miss a tremendous amount of pathology in this group. A vast majority of symptoms as well as both ischemia and arrhythmia occur in that last 10% of workload. So making certain you have stress protocols to accomplish that is of, of paramount importance. Palpitations, again, uh, quite common in young, healthy people. Most of the time, palpitations occur under resting conditions in the, in the context of profound bradycardia, which is an athletic adaptation. There's just simply more time for the ventricles and the atria to excite. So you get PVCs and you get PACs, and because the athletes are exquisitely in touch with their body, they feel these things and they wonder why they're there. I will also say, and there are no good studies to, um, to substantiate this, but this is just a routine and repetitive clinical observation, and that is that athletes that are using prescription stimulants to assist with either schoolwork or occupational tasks are much more likely to be aware of their symptoms. Uh, perhaps there's a bit of an inotropic property of these meds that makes the PACs and the PVCs a little bit more distinguishable, but that's an important part of the history. That being said, sometimes palpitations can be an indicator of, of clinically relevant electrical or, or myocardial pathology. And again, the, the key historical feature that usually differentiates benign from pathologic palpitations is their response to exercise. So the first question that should be asked of an athlete that presents with palpitations is what happens when you exercise? Do they get better or do they get worse? And in any athlete that tells you that their palpitation burden picks up during exercise, these, much like the, the syncopal athletes that go down on the court, these are the ones that require the, the, the full evaluation. Key points in the document around palpitations. Um, any athlete that has palpitations that occur or intensify during exercise needs to have at least a TTE to exclude underlying structural disease. Uh, again, these people should not only be evaluated with imaging, but also with some form of provocative exercise testing. And then a, a slight tangential caveat, but an important one about evaluating athletes that are found to have ventricular pre-excitation on their 12 lead ECG, the so-called Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern. All of these athletes need imaging, uh, typically to start with a transthoracic echo, to exclude the structural heart diseases that come along with pre-excitation, including Epstein's anomaly, thick heart from a PRK AG2 gene mutation, uh, or typical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then of course the myriad complex forms of congenital heart disease that also carry accessory pathways. Inappropriate exertional dyspnea, which if any of you have been trying to run recently with a mask on, you know what that feels like. It's miserable, but it is a very common complaint among uh, healthy athletes. And what I'll uh, do to just frame this for you is remind you of the concept illustrated here in the classic Wasserman diagram, in which we follow the flow of oxygen into the body through the lungs, through the heart and circulation into the muscle, where it's used to metabolize ATP and generate force contraction, and then back out through the system as carbon dioxide. The reason understanding this, um, this, this gear and spoke diagram is important is that any of those systems that break down 
can lead to exercise intolerance. And the most common symptom associated with exercise tolerance, which is not specific to failure in any of these three major systems, is shortness of breath. So the athlete that comes in and complains of breathing that's more labored at a task that used to be easy has inappropriate exertional dyspnea and, and that needs to be considered in, in the evaluation. Um, almost all heart muscle, heart electrical, heart artery diseases can cause inappropriate exertional dyspnea. So keeping a very broad differential and having a low threshold to at least get a transthoracic echo is important. Uh, and again, just like we've talked about with syncope and palpitations, if people feel symptoms during exercise, Resting imaging is not enough. They need something during provocative exercise to, to help further delineate pathology. And then perhaps the most difficult one of all is so-called athletic performance decrement. I put this, this ugly looking equation up here because this is in the clinic how complicated the evaluation of this complaint is. This is the person that comes in and just simply tells you or shows you objective data that they're not able to compete as well as they used to. And the reason this is so complicated is that in addition to true health problems that cause this, this is attributable often to a constellation of things like a lifestyle, rest, sleep, hygiene, relationships, stress, diet. And so this is where, and sometimes painfully, we as cardiovascular docs have to return to our basic broad internal medicine approach and think outside the box. But indeed, performance decrement uh, can be caused by heart problems. So when this is part of the evaluation, uh, transthoracic echocardiography is, 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 is appropriate when the initial evaluation, which is history, physical, 12-week ECG, and blood work, um, don't show any sign or when they suggest cardiac pathology. And here, um, the use of exercise testing or, or adjunct imaging should really only be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So to conclude, there are three additional sections of the paper that deal with uh, very specific patient populations, master's level athletes, pediatric athletes, and congenital heart disease athletes. And I'll just say a quick word about each of them. The majority of the master's level um, athlete discussion in this paper focuses on some of the challenges of using coronary artery calcium scoring in this population. And as a group, we felt it was important to recommend against doing this routinely simply because being athletic in its own right causes deposition in the proximal uh, coronary arteries. And this is not a particularly useful tool for risk stratification in this group. Pediatric athletes are a challenge for a number of reasons, probably first and foremost because they represent everything from small prepubertal pe people to those that are at the tail end of puberty and there is just a, a, a really unfortunate dearth of normative data to help us understand how age and sport and puberty coalesce to, de to determine what's normal for their heart. So this, I would say as an adult cardiologist, to have a very low threshold to engage my pediatric colleagues and to discuss these cases. And oftentimes we're left with using logic rather than data, but can, it can be frustrating. And then finally, um, adult congenital heart disease in the athlete. Here's a picture of, of Sean White, who many of you are familiar with, who had, has congenital heart disease and also went on to be one of the, the world's best snowboard athletes of all time. I think what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years is that the congenital heart patient and doctor community have moved from a, a position of complete phobia of exercise to one of being much more per permissive and understanding its value, particularly in the development of young adults. And so what the document really did is called uh, very aggressively for a need for future research to understand how a congenital lesion superimposed with sport physiology can combine to, to determine morphology and what, if anything, we can learn from, uh, from outcomes when young adults with congenital disease decide to, to maintain an athletic identity. So with that, I'm going to call it quits and I'm going to take any questions here. If people want to submit questions to the q and I'll pop those open and try to do that. We've got a good 10 minutes or so, so I encourage people to be as participatory as possible. Um, okay, there's a couple questions in here. Um, the first one says, are the physiologic changes of endurance or isometric sports reversible or they, do they remain unchanged? I have seen patients with LVH in their 50s and 60s with no, and no hypertension. They tell me they did competitive sports in their 20s and 30s. Great question. So the question gets at whether or not the, the findings attributable to exercise-induced cardiac remodeling are reversible or not. And the answer is kind of yes, kind of no. So when I say that, I mean that there, there are a relatively small number of detraining studies. But indeed, when we've looked at detraining, there is clearly regression. And the, the real question is how quickly does it regress? How completely does it regress? And can we use regression to help us differentiate health from disease? Um, regression typically happens pretty quickly, whether we're talking about reductions in chamber size or reductions in wall thickness. So on the order of three to six months, for the most part, 
whatever regression is going to occur is typically going to occur. Our experience has been that LV walls regress almost completely, <clears throat> whereas chamber dimensions, and this was illustrated in a, a very nice study of, of retired Olympic athletes in Italy, they normalized their wall thicknesses, but indeed um, did not do so with respect to chamber dimensions. So years after being elite athletes, they, they retained uh, dilated ventricles. And that is something that I think we've seen clinically and something I don't think we fully understand. I will say that although there's a fair bit of enthusiasm for using the detraining response to help differentiate health from disease, I've become convinced having done that experiment clinically many times that it's a, actually a very, very little utility. Next question here is from a coronary perspective, do the words cardiac chest pain exclude patients whose pain occurs only at rest? Um, yeah, so with the exception of um, acute coronary syndromes and the sequela of dissection, um, ischemic chest pain that comes from a coronary e etiology should, if it manifests, manifest with increasing exertion. So I've not seen a patient with a young patient with an anomalous coronary that only had symptoms at rest. Typically, there is an exertional component to it, and the, the nature of the pain, the magnitude of the pain is dependent upon the level of exertion. Um, next question is, how difficult do you find it to obtain CTCMR for anomalous coronary imaging when TTE fails? What are your recommendations to combat this when there is pushback? Yeah, I think pushback is real in the imaging world. Um, and unfortunately, this almost always requires a peer-to-peer -peer with the MD at the end of the phone who's representing your insurance company. Um, I can think of many situations where I've had to take it to that level, but very, very, very few where I've gotten to that level and not gotten the test I want. It's hard, it's hard pressed for someone to argue with you when you explain the fact that um, this diagnosis kills people and the echocardiogram is not sufficiently sensitive nor specific to exclude or confirm this diagnosis? And would you like this young patient to be at risk for sudden death during sport? So I guess I tend to take kind of a hard line with these insurance investigators and have found it to be uh, time consuming, but ultimately usually successful. Um, let's see here. So next question is doing significant endurance sport actually okay? Is having a dilated left ventricle actually healthy? What about risk of AFib or MR? So great questions, the, and not a part of this document because this is much more a question that has to do with, with masters athletes, men and women who have pushed hard over many, many decades. Um, still a topic of some debate. I would say that from my perspective, um, lots of endurance sports over many years have been shown to confer increased longevity and generally come along with a more favorable health profile. So I, I typically do not counsel people not to do lots of endurance sports over many years with the caveat that the one diagnosis we know is uh, increased in, in, in endurance athletes and that's atrial fibrillation. So I like saying that atrial fibrillation is the Achilles heel of the athlete and, and it is, it's the Achilles heel of the athlete's heart. Um, anywhere from 15 to 20% of lifelong endurance athletes will get it <clears throat> and its management can be tricky. And this is a whole nother hour long lecture, but the decision to go with the sinus maintenance approach, the decision when and how to anticoagulate are all at this point complete extrapolations from what we do in the general population. And one can make a very logical argument that, that a CHADS2 VAS score of one in a 60-year-old endurance athlete is very different than it is in someone with heart failure, um, particularly with respect to the risk-benefit ratio of anticoagulation. So those are shared decision-making uh, experiences in which um, we do not have a lot of data to guide us. And I actually think that that is one of the areas in our field that needs the next 10 years to be focused on. So um, a follow-up to the CT question, and that is, in other words, to combat the insurance provider pushback. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we take care of our patients, and if we're thoughtful and follow guidelines and have dialogue with peers, we're typically going to be in the right with respect to what, we, what what's best for our patients. And if we feel strongly enough about a test to spend an hour waiting for some insurance doctor on the phone to come back and talk to us, usually it's because we've thought this through well enough to know it's, it's what our patient needs. And I would um, very humbly submit that push, pushing back there is quite appropriate. All right, next question is, how do you decide whether to proceed with CTMR or follow up in three months asymptomatic patient with inconclusive TTE and normal max exercise stress test? Um, so I guess this boils down to what the diagnostic question is. If the inconclusive TTE is following up on an overtly 
abnormal ECG and an ECG that suggests myocardial pathology, I would proceed right away with, with some form of tonographic imaging, usually MR in that situation. Um, in general, if I'm thinking about TTE as being inconclusive and there's a diagnosis that carries any risk with it, I'm not inclined to wait um, till proceeding with that additional imaging. Um, follow-up is critical once you've made a diagnosis and any athlete that gets diagnosed needs longitudinal follow-up uh, and oftentimes exercise testing for risk stratification. But to be direct in my answer here, if I'm thinking about an MR uh, to follow up a TTE, I'm not waiting. Um, let's see here, there's more questions. Sorry, just give me a second to get down to them. What is the added benefit of performing exercise stress testing in athletes with chest pain during exertion if imaging documents structurally normal heart and coronary arteries? Um, oh, that's, that's a great question. So the answer is that um, there's no imaging findings that exclude the possibility of myocardial ischemia or inducible arrhythmia during exercise. So if an athlete comes in with true typical chest pain, meaning it occurs during exertion, it increases with exercise intensity, and you have a normal echo and a normal CT or a normal MR, you probably wouldn't have gone to the CT or the MR uh, before the exercise stress test to begin with, but you're not done with that evaluation until you push that person to their maximal volitional fatigue and exclude inducible arrhythmias uh, and or um, evidence of myocardial ischemia. And so that should be done before any of the additional imaging and it's part and parcel standard of care in athletes with exertional symptoms. Any other questions? I love them, so keep them coming. Okay, thank you, Dr. Baggish, for answering those questions. As a reminder, you may claim credit for your Learning Hub account, and you will receive an email in the next hour or so with instructions on how to get credit. Thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar and a very special thanks to Dr. Bagish for presenting on behalf of ASC. Be sure to keep watch for future live webinars by checking the ASC Learning Hub homepage. Thank you again and have a very nice afternoon.